<laughs> Some of you are good. I, I still have questions about the rest of you, but all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're going to pick up there, but I, I want to pray again. And uh, I uh, was up early this morning, and after I'd gotten my uh, got through my notes again and all that. I, I got on social media for something. I forget what. And uh, the first things I saw um, was that a friend of mine died yesterday. And he is, uh, and you got, I posted this this morning. You may have seen it. Uh, he is, was, I'm not there yet. I'm so okay. He was the lead pastor of a church in Pasadena, a long time Acts 29 guy. Um, he came in probably a year after I did. And so been around for a long time. Been uh, Planted Prism Church, Prism with an M, not prison. I know with me, you never know, so I get it, right? Prism Church in Pasadena. Even Abby laughed at that one. All right, so uh, that's my humor. It's like middle school humor anyhow. So anyhow, he, uh, he died in a motorcycle accident yesterday, and uh, uh, when Lisa woke up this morning, I told her, and uh, the first thing she said, you always told me if you die on the bike, man, you died having fun. And just, uh, right? And so... Uh, I was thinking about his wife, of course, and, and I've reached out to her and then his church. And so Chuck's last message was Easter Sunday. And see, I don't know how I feel. I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Like I kind of went, oh, you know, but kind of went out on a high note too, I guess, so to speak. And so anyhow, uh, I told Pastor Paul this morning, I said, I don't know if that happened to me and you got the news on a Saturday afternoon that Sunday was going to be very, very different. Um, but at least I know we have a seasoned leader in Pastor Paul. He could, he could walk us through that lament and, and mourning and joy and, and whatever they're going through. And I don't know uh, that the chapel church in Pasadena has that. And so uh, I'm sure God will guide them through this. But anyhow, my heart aches for them, obviously for my friend, but for the church who this morning, you know, may have been preparing for whatever we're doing and and maybe going through something very different. So I just want to pray for them real quick. God, we love you. We thank you. Our hope is in you. We know that. We know that. Uh, it's still hard when we lose people we care about, Lord. And uh, just testing, texting with Pastor Mike Brown, Pastor Mike Larson, Pastor Vinny this morning, just a handful of us, um, Ryan Kwan up north, just our heart is heavy. I pray for Carolyn. I pray for their kids. Lord, I pray for... Uh, the chapel of Pasadena, Lord, uh, be with them. We all proclaim an eternal gospel. We all place our trust in you, an eternal king. Uh, but we also mourn the separation of those we love. And uh, I remember a Sunday morning after Brian died, and I remember walking to church through that as we lost people together. And so I just pray for them this morning. I pray that you'd be with them, uh, be with Chuck's family, Lord. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I lost my best friend on a Saturday. He was a part of our church. And I remember that. That next day was tough. So here we are this morning. Uh, it's relative, I guess. But David is mourning the loss of King Saul. Now, it's a different circumstance, right? As we just heard in the liturgy, uh, we heard David kill the messenger, if you will. Uh, but the messenger also lies and says... He killed the king, right? He killed King Saul. Well, King Saul was chasing after and going to kill David, who has been on the run from King Saul for quite some time. But David, having many opportunities to kill Saul, even though he was pursuing him, never did. He always said, no, who am I to raise a hand to the Lord's anointed, right? And then he repeats himself to a guy who claims to have killed Saul who didn't, if you remember from 1 Samuel 31, I guess the last chapter for Samuel is 31. Um, David falls on his own sword. He asks his, ar his armor bearer to kill him, and, and he can't. He just won't do it. And so Saul ends up falling on his own sword rather than being killed by the enemies after, after a, a very mortal wounding. And so that's kind of where the story picks up. We're in that place in that transition. And um, David has been promised by God and anointed by the prophet that he will be king, right? And so he's not king because Saul was king, but he will be king. Now, this would be that natural moment where David would know, okay, it's my turn, right? And we'll, we'll watch as that plays out. But here's what I want to begin with. David executes the man who says he killed Saul. 
And he just, he asked this question again, who are you, right, to think that you get to kill the Lord's anointed person, right, the, the, the Lord's king? Like, who, who do you think you are? I want to tie today into the political division in America, and, and specifically, political division in the church, right? As we are followers of Jesus, we are called to be a people that are united on more things than we are divided. That doesn't play out in reality here in America. Christians on the left, Christians on the right, constantly very divided. And again, for the rest of people, for those who don't believe, for whatever, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about us, right? How we live in this division, right? And so if you look back over the last four presidents, this one and the last three, right? Biden, Trump, Obama, Bush, there's a good chance there's somebody there in that group you don't like, right? There's somebody for sure you didn't vote for, I'm guessing, right? Maybe all of them, who knows? right? But who are we? When God allows someone to be president, when God, if God is God, if God is who we say he is, if God is sovereign, who are we to then not respect at least the office, right? Even when they're not respectful, which for sure the last, this one and the last two have not been, uh, always against each other. Who are we? And so I just want to, I want to take that political division. We're not going to pick any topics. We're not going to pick any teams, but I want to talk about division as it relates to the church. All right. Here's a main idea for you. Doing the right thing when others are not. Ideological and political divisions sometimes cause, or <laughs> often or always seem to cause American Christians to oppose each other. How do we know what is right or how to do the right thing when so many disagree? Just look at any social media post, and you'll see Christians on both sides of the conversation, and listen for the language they use, and, and listen to how they treat one another, and just know just God's calling us to something better than that. Fair? Second Samuel, we're going to pick up in chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, After this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. And David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, to Hebron. So here's where we are. King Saul's out, right? He has died. David has been anointed to be the next king, right? God has told him, you're going to be king. And so here he is in this moment. But rather than assuming, okay, I'm up, right? It's my term at bat, right? I'm, I'm up. I love that David pauses and asks God, God, okay, what do I do, right? He says, after this, David inquired of the Lord. Now, how many of us, and, and I think I would probably fall into this, but how many of us just assume, okay, it's my turn, I know, man, go in, be king, do what God has said, and, and really would feel like, okay, I'm doing what God has told me to do, right? I love that David pauses for this moment and asks God, okay, what do I do, right? No assumptions, and just knowing God had anointed him to be king, it, it's even a, maybe a reasonable assumption, but David does what we should do and pauses and asks God. So verse 2. So David went up from there, and he and his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. So God directs him to Hebron. David goes to Hebron. He takes his family, the wife that was the daughter of Saul that was not the daughter of Saul that he was promised, but the other one, right, that he was given and that whole story. And then, of course, the Abigail, right, who uh, was the wife of Nabal and stopped David from making probably the greatest mistake to date that we've watched David do. Uh, Abigail, who he goes on to love deeply. So he takes these families his men, these 600 men that have been fighting men, following him, fighting with him, doing all this, and all their families, and they move into Hebron. Verse 4, and then the men of Judah came, one of the tribes of Israel, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And so think promised versus installed when you hear that the prophet anointed him to be king, right? There's a promise of God on you. But it's not today. In fact, he did this when David was a young boy, or a young teenager, right? And then, all, and then he goes into Saul's house. He becomes well-known in Israel. All these things, Saul starts chasing him around, trying to kill him. All these things happen between the moment God says, you're going to be king, and much later, 
when he becomes king. And even in this moment, he's only king over one of the 12 tribes. Now, they know what God has said to him, right? They know what Eli the, the, the prophet uh, I'm sorry, Samuel the prophet, not Eli the priest. Samuel the prophet has said over him and prayed over him and anointed him. But when, when, you, hear, when you hear anointed by God and then actually becomes king, kind of think like voted on and elected versus installed, right? Like that there's this separation of time. In this case, it's a lot of time. It's not just a couple months, right? It, it's a, a lot of time. Many, many years go by. David knows this promise hangs over him that he is the right king for Israel, but then the house of Judah comes, this one of the tribes comes, and they say, listen, we know you're supposed to be king, you're our king. So I want to put a note on the screen, David accepts what God gives him. So David has the right to be king, but not until God permits it, right? Our rights are never more important than what God calls us to do. And there's been a lot of that over the last year, right? Just over a year ago, right, 13 months ago, we chose, we chose actually first before California even asked, but we chose to go online only. Things were ramping up. We didn't know a whole lot about the virus, and we knew we already have an online campus. We already have live streaming people. We have people, uh, you guys had gone on vacations and used our live stream. It wasn't unknown to us. It wasn't unfamiliar. And so we knew we could toggle over to online only fairly easily make a few phone calls, make sure some of the folks that weren't on social media could get to our live stream, and we could do that, right? And then uh, California said churches couldn't meet indoors, and, and there went kind of the, the Christian uprising, if you will. There were those who said, listen, we have the right to meet, which is true constitutionally, and then there were those who, that's not, you know, loving of others, that's not, you know, submission to leadership, and there was this contrast, if you will, and, and people passionate on both sides. And here's what I've said repeatedly over and over. The Constitution gives us a whole lot of rights that maybe God doesn't want us to exercise, right? That God gives us the way to go. Now, the Constitution gives us lots of freedoms, right? Lots of things we can do. But God calls us to things. And, so, and that list of things that God calls us to is often much narrower than our rights would afford us. Did we have the right to meet indoors and, and do whatever? Yes. Supreme Court decided that too in December, that they couldn't tell us not to meet indoors. We still didn't meet indoors. We didn't feel like that was the best thing for us. So we continued to meet outdoors. And when things got crazy, we went back to online only for three weeks. Now here we are, right? I posted a note yesterday. The Supreme Court made another decision. In-home gatherings like our community groups can gather, can do that. You can't restrict that. Uh, all kinds of things. But we have tried to navigate, okay, what do we do, right? What is God calling us to do? I hope we've gotten it right. You know, I hope that we've submitted to authority, right, as the Bible calls us to do. I hope it's been loving to those who might be vulnerable. I hope we've honored that. I hope that our witness has been right before others, both the watching world and those inside. But it's not always easy to figure out, right? And what I will say is that our rights are often, we often have a lot more right to do something, that's an American statement, than what God will call us to do. God often calls us to limit what we're allowed to do, what we're able or capable or have the right to do. He calls us to kind of deny that for the sake of others. Lots of churches landed in places where they wanted to land, what was comfortable for them, maybe based on rights or what they liked, Oftentimes, and, I, and their decision is their decision. But for me, God often calls us to do what is uncomfortable and hard for the sake of the kingdom. David does that in this moment. He is just king over one of the 12 tribes, even though he has every right to be the king, even by God's anointing, but maybe not by God's timing. Obviously, a needle to thread there for David, he's trying to figure out. But I think of the gospel, I think of God creating us and loving us and designing us and making us to be worshipers of his and then our sin separating us from God. God has every right to let us run headlong into hell. But in love, God did the hard thing. In fact, Jesus, God, 
creator God, eternal God, became human, there's a lot of limiting himself in that, a lot of denying who he is to be confined to a small space, and then to live a life of sacrifice. And then to go on, and as we just went through a Good Friday and Easter Sunday, to go and die for us, right? That's a lot of sacrifice on Jesus' part. Did he have the right to not die? He surely did. He was sinless. He was perfect. He is God. He need not die. He, doesn't, he has the right to be in God's presence apart from the gospel. He is the gospel. But he laid down his rights for you and for me. He laid down what was rightly not supposed to happen to him, and he had the power to demolish the world when they came for him to re- arrest him or crucify him or beat him. He could have just kind of like pew, flicked everybody, you know, I mean, like everything. He, he has the power, he has the right, but he sacrificed himself. He gave his life for us. And then he calls us in a much smaller way to live sacrificially. He calls us to go on and live a life, of, a life of sacrifice, deny our rights, things that are rightfully ours, lay those down at his feet to live in such a way that other people will see him. That's how we learn to follow Jesus. And again, no application. So we do this in church or don't do this in church. Or we vote for this. Or we vote. I'm no, no team jersey today. But a life of sacrifice is clearly one we're called to. Philippians 2 says this, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. If Jesus can do that, we can lay down our right to gather indoors, in person. And we can suck it up and do it outside, or we can do it online. We can do whatever. Because in the grand scheme of things, I can meet online for 13 months, or I can take what Jesus took, I'm online for 13 months, right? If I have a choice, or outdoors, and have to kind of frantically call a bunch of people and get the news out, oh, it rained today, we're out, you know what I mean? I, it is what it is. It's not that big of a deal, considering what Jesus did for us, right? Back in 2 Samuel, verse 4, the second half of it. When they told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul, David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord because you showed this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. Saul was, let's just say, David's enemy. That's not necessarily true. Saul felt David was his enemy. David didn't feel the same way. He was on the run for his life, so there's some enemy, if you will, to it. But even when David had opportunity, and the guy with him is like, let me pin this dude to the ground with my spear. I won't miss. One shot. I got this. It's like, no. This is God's anointed king, right? David always saw him not as an enemy, but as God's king, even though Saul Saul saw David as an enemy. But when I say that, you get this enemy idea, right? For sure, he was trying to kill David. But David honors who he was because of God. And he says this, and and he he blesses the men. He asks, who are the people that buried Saul? Now, you've got to see this from an Israel perspective. Thousands of years ago, he's a horrible king, right? He's been chasing the guy who's been the best thing for the kingdom. He's been taking them into wars and doing things. He's been dishonoring God. He's been losing battles because he's dishonoring God. He hasn't been obedient to God. When God tells him to go in, wipe everybody out, it's a wicked nation, do this, he doesn't. And when God doesn't tell him, he goes to war anyhow, and they lose, and so he's not a good king. But still these men in Jabesh Gilead bury him, they honor him. And David blesses them for honoring him. One of the last things that, that kind of I remember about Bush's uh, 43, his presidency, was just his statement like, his job is just to shut up and let the next guy be the president, right? His job isn't to say right or wrong. And he faded into the background. And he said, and he, and he, he wrote in his book later, he talks about just honoring the office of president. And I think it's the most tangible thing we have. I think we've lost that. Our last three presidents have really not embraced that idea much. But 
we get that idea that there's somebody in that office is deserving of respect. That this is, this is something great, even if we disagree with the person who's doing that job, right? And if you live long enough, you're going to disagree with somebody who's doing that job. But still, they're the president. And that's where David is. He's like, he's still God's king. He's king over the people. God still put him there. Right or wrong, trying to kill me, not trying to kill me. I want to honor those who recognize that and do the right thing. That's missing today in the church because of political division. Not good at doing just the right thing or honoring people who honor others we disagree with. Verse 6. Now may the Lord show you, David goes on blessing them. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Now therefore, let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them, right? Honoring Saul was the right thing to do, and they did that. The people of Jabesh Gilead, they buried him. They gave him respect as the king. Politicized culture doesn't show do the right thing. It's the ends justify the means. You can do the wrong thing because we have the right thing in mind. So it doesn't matter how we get there. The ends justify the means, right? And this, he says, listen, I know what he was doing was bad. I was the one he was trying to kill. But I want to honor him because he was king. And then he blesses them for doing the right thing. We demonize people. I remember we were doing, the high school students, we were doing rooted uh, a year ago right now, right? We were just talking about some of the, the highly charged things online. Trump or uh, George Floyd uh, were coming up on that, right? And, and we were doing that. And I remember comments like, I, you can't say anything. You, you say one thing, you get crushed from people over here. You, say, you just get crushed from people over here. There's, you can't satisfy people. Like you, you just have to be polarized and accept that, but you can't say anything. David is doing the opposite of that. You honored the guy who was trying to kill me, but what you did was right, and I want to bless you for doing what is right. Just imagine that in our culture. Imagine that just, I, and I, again, I'm limiting this to the church in America. Really, us. Imagine just blessing someone who's on the opposite side because what they do is just right, or even in this culture, being able to see that what they're doing is right. And here's a note for you. Blessing those who do it right. Doing the right thing, especially when it costs us, is hard enough. We need to honor those who do right, especially when on opposing sides. We need to recognize the good in people. We need to recognize the right thing to do. And we need to bless those especially, not when they're on our team, because we do that really easy, but when they're on the other side, when they wear the other jersey. You're in one color, they're in another. And you disagree with the platform of that team. But there are people out there doing the right thing, doing good things, doing honoring things. We need to recognize that. Verse 8, but Abner, this is, leave that idea now, kind of on the other side of the story. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took in Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead, and the Asherites, and Jezreel, and Ephraim, and Benjamin, and all Israel. So here comes Abner, who is not a son of Saul. He is a commander of the military. He's been pursuing David as well. So now he knows I'm on the opposite side. Like my team just lost and David's on the rise. And so he goes and he gets Saul's son and he makes Saul's son king over Israel, right? So power is what he wants to keep. He wants to stay in his position of commander over the army and he can't be king. So he's going to prop up this other guy to be king so he can keep his position, verse 10, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David, right? So Abner sets up a king for his own power. If that doesn't give us a window into our political climate, right, what people will do to hang on to power, so power, not purpose. Here's a note for you. Division is about power. It's not about convictions or beliefs. Political parties exist to hold power. They advance causes to get votes, not to achieve outcomes. That's why we're talking about the same things we've been talking about for the last four election cycles, or five, or six, or ten election cycles. Because they're about keeping power. So they use the things you and I are passionate about, and they prop them up as a platform, whether they support them or don't, 
but they get you divided with others so that you'll give them their vote so that they can keep power. Yet they never fix the problem. Immigration is still a problem. Abortion is still a problem. All the stuff is still a problem. Nothing's been fixed because it's just used to divide us. That's what Abner does. He props up somebody on this team because he'll lose everything if this team wins. And so he sets somebody up. This guy should be king. You guys should support him. This, he could care less about him. He just wants to keep power. Verse 12, Abner, the son of Ner, the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out to Mahanaim, to Gibeon, and Joab, the son of Zariah, and the servants of David, went out to meet them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So imagine the scene. This is the face-off, right? It's not as big because you hear pool, but imagine, like, you know, Israel's on one side, the Philistines are on the other, and Goliath is calling out, hey, just send somebody out to fight, right? Like, I'll fight anybody. You win, we'll serve you. We win, you serve us, right? It's that big showdown scene. Well, this is this little face-off around a small body of water, and here come some of the folks from Israel, and here come some of the folks from Judah, that support David, and these are under Ishbosheth, Saul's son, and they come out, and you get this kind of this showdown, right? Kind of that feel of, 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 of opposing parties, kind of this, you can just see what's coming, right? You can feel it. Verse 14, and Abner, from this side, says to Joab, on this side, he says, let the young man arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. And they arose and passed over by number, 12 for Benjamin, and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12, the servants of David. So here's what you get. It's kind of a boys will be boys, right? It's 12 guys from this team are going to fight 12 guys from this team. But notice the two guys that make this decision aren't fighting. It's easy to send everybody else in to pick that fight, right? Well, you send out 12 guys, I'll send out 12 guys. We'll see what happens, right? And next thing you know, they're fighting. Verse 16. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword into his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place was called Helkath Hazarim, which is at Gibeon. So how does this 12 on 12 fight work out? 24 dead people. That's how it works out. This side and this side both fall into the same trap and 24 bodies lie on the ground, right? Division always makes us suffer, right? It always makes us who get divided suffer. And it's often not the folks that pick that 12 on 12 that seem to get caught up in it, right? And so here we are, 24 people laying on the ground and dead, verse 17, and the battle was very fierce that day. So clearly didn't stop at the 12 on 12, though everybody said it would, right? And the battle was very fierce that day, and Abner Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. So two things happened. Both teams suffer losses, right? Both groups suffer losses. But also, God does begin to move David up, like David is going to take power. But this isn't the way that God had told David to do. Now, David's not there. I get that. But the people who follow him are. And so, no, they're not doing exactly like David. Now, if they were, they wouldn't have gotten in this 12-on-12 thing. They wouldn't have been there, probably. They've been waiting on God to figure out, okay, how do we do this? Right now, what God has said is, I want you to go up to Jabez Gilead, and I want you to hang out there. And then Judah made him king of Judah. He hadn't told him anything else. But some of those folks on that team decided they were going to go pop off at some of the other guys. And here we have this little skirmish, and here we have a bunch of death, and then we have a massive battle, and everybody's losing. Now, God is giving the victory to the side that he is going to bless, but it didn't have to look like this. Verse 18, when the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel was as swift as the foot of a wild gazelle, and Asahel pursued Abner, and as he went, he turned neither to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. So Abner, the one who began all the drama, runs away, right? That's how deep his convictions are. Asahel pursues him, and evidently Asahel's pretty quick, and catches him. Verse 20. Then Abner looked down at him and said, Is it you, Asahel? And he answered, It is I. And Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand to your left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. He gives up one of his own guys. Again, that's how deep his convictions run, right? But Asahel would not turn aside from following. So now, Abner, who stirred up all the problems, right? Hey, aren't we brothers? Asahel said, We weren't brothers. 
15 minutes ago when you wanted us to fight, right? It's kind of like that whoever's in power, the other side is saying, listen, we need bipartisan agreement and bipartisan this and until they gain power and then bipartisanship's out the window and the other team's saying the same thing. That's what he's doing. Aren't we brothers? Aren't we on the same side? Aren't we on the same team? Only because you're running for your life. When you thought you had power, we weren't brothers. Now that you're losing, aren't we brothers? Verse 22, and Abner said again to Asahel, turn aside from following. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear so that the spear came out of his back. The blunt side, by the way. That's brutal, right? Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear so the spear came out of his back and there he fell and died where he was. And all who came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died stood still. The bad guy in this case wins the fight, right? Yes, the folks that follow David are winning the battle. But the guy doing the wrong thing, even though he's on the right team, dies for this. Yes, David is supposed to be king, but not at the end of the sword. Because you're killing your own people. Division is literally killing them right now. And the inability to walk away from an argument here, from a fight, the inability of that gave a guy who followed the right guy, gave him the end of his life. Verse 24, but Joab and Abishai pursued Abner, and as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amma, which lies before Gia, on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon, and the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on the top of a hill. So others pursue Abner, but now Abner's caught up to the people of Benjamin who are on his side. Now you're staring at an army behind Abner. All because you couldn't let the fight go, right? Verse 26, then Abner called to Joab, shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? I love it that he's losing now and now we're brothers again, right? I, I, you know, aren't we brothers? No, you just wanted to fight. And then he kills him. And another guy's chasing him. Listen, the sword is going to be bitter. Like this fight, we're going to lose people on both sides. But like the civil war here, both sides are us. Yeah, there's some right and wrong there. But everybody we lose is us. Everybody who dies in this battle is Israel. And they're recognizing, hey, we're fighting our own. How far have we fallen? Verse 27, and Joab said, as God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of your brothers until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the men stopped and pursued Israel nor, no more, nor did they fight anyone. They begin to show mercy. So the guys that are supporting David, the guys that are under David, begin to chase everybody. As they beat one tribe down, they chase him until the leader goes and he finds another tribe, and there's going to be another battle. But you remember, these are the seasoned 600 warriors who have been, man, fighting for David when God leads them out and getting victory after victory. They're suffering losses, too, because they're not following David right now. It isn't a fight that God has called them to. Even though they'll win, they're still not right. And people on both sides are dying. People on both sides are hurting. Verse 29, it says, And Abner and his men went all that night through the Arabah, and they crossed the Jordan, and marching the whole morning, they came to Mahanaim. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, they were missing from David's servants 19 men besides Asahel, so 20 men total. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin 360 of Abner's men. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. So here's what happens. 20 men on this side die, 360 on that side die, and that's a, that's a I mean, in, in any battle, any war, that's a victory, right? Unless you're the family of those 20 men, then it's not so good. You're like, why are we fighting this fight anyhow? Well, did David say that? Did God say that? Or did my husband or my brother or my son, did, did he die for some petty fight? Yeah, they lost 360, but I lost someone I love. That changes the game. 2 Samuel 3, verse 1 says this. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger 
while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. Ultimately, God blesses David in this. Ultimately, David will become king. But it didn't have to look this way. Ultimately, presidents come and go. This one will eventually go. And someone else will come. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen in three years. It could happen in seven years. Whatever. What do we do in the meantime? Do we just fight within you always continue this cycle, and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but all the time somebody gets hurt. And all the time we're not where God would have us to be. What David does and what those who actually follow David here do looks a lot like what Jesus does for us. We just haven't made a quick list. So David acquired of the Lord, right? Jesus did that. David followed the Lord, not his own rights. We just talked about that. Jesus did that, right? Jesus had the right to not go through all that, but he sacrificed it for us. David had the right to be king over Israel, but he took one tribe as God led him and waited. David did what was right at his own cost. David honors the, honored those who opposed him when they did the right thing. David showed mercy to his enemies. Ultimately, David is being blessed by God, not by himself. And David gets, ultimately, David gets exactly what God tells him. He will be king. But how do we get there, right? God will have victory. Jesus will lead, right? The, the, worth, the world will be changed. Like, all that is broken will be restored. That's the promise of the gospel. Will it be today? Will it be tomorrow? Will it be in a million years? I don't know. But Jesus will win, right? And, and we will be restored to God. And we will be with him forever. And that while we're here, we will struggle, Right? And we will live in a broken world. And not in spite of our faith, but because of our faith, we will do things that are hard. And we will choose, I hope, if we're following Jesus, we will choose to do the hard thing because that's what he calls us to. That we will suffer for his name because he suffered for us. And that we will do what is right, whatever that may be, even when it costs us. Because that's what our Savior did. Because that's what Jesus did for us. That's what God did. He gave his son for me. So I can lay down whatever thing, whether it's meeting together for a short time or having my small group meet on Zoom or, or whatever it might be, meeting outdoors when it's windy. or what. It all seems kind of trivial right now. When I think about my friend and I think about his church right now that are worshiping together without their lead pastor I feel like indoor-outdoor feels kind of trivial right now. If you're live streaming and you're joining us, we miss you. We love you. We wish you were here. But that doesn't seem like the most important thing right now, that it, whether we're online or in person. What seems more important is what is God calling us to do? And every voting season, which, you know, these two-year increments that come around, they kind of just spike the division. And, and again, I want to limit that to the church. Those of us that profess to follow Jesus ought to have a lot more in common than we do that divides us. We're going to be divided on issues. We're going to struggle with some of the things we see differently. But we need to learn how to act differently. Love better. Jesus says this, and I'll close with this, John 13. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this... All people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's just take that snapshot. It was 2,000 years ago, so it's not a new command to you and I. We know better. If this is the first time you're hearing it, you get a pass. Tomorrow, you know better, right? Just imagine Jesus says, by this, they'll know you're my disciples, by your love for one another. What do people think about us right now? If they measure us by this metric, by our love for each other, when we disagree on social media about something that seems ultimately kind of dumb right now, and, and they're not all dumb. People aren't dumb. People are migrating. Or the, the unborn. That's not dumb. But our arguments are dumb, and the things we say are dumb. And they're frivolous, and they're not changing anybody's minds. They're causing the division. If we were to be, to me be measured by this, 
By this, all people will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. How do you think we're measuring up right now? As the church, how do you think we measure up? Let's pray. Jesus, if we were to measure you by your love for us, which we do, if we're being honest, that's why we're here. But we can do that when you show up because you do love us. Because we can see that. Because you loved us when we didn't love you. When we were still your enemies, it says you died for us. We see David honor those who honor his quote-unquote enemy. He doesn't want him to be an enemy, but, the, but Saul did. How do we treat others that we disagree with? How do we treat others that mistreat us? is a bit of the metric that you are calling us to measure ourselves by. Because that's what the world is measuring us by. By our lack of love for one another. It's not by our disagreement. It's not that we see things differently. It's how we see them differently. It's how we act as we see them differently. It's how we speak to one another with whom we disagree. And Jesus, it always impacts my heart to remember that you spoke to sinful people kindly people that opposed you kindly you said father forgive them for they know not what they do to the people crucifying you but you had your sharpest words for the religious that ought to cause that ought to force us to our knees then it's for folks like us that you challenge the hardest and you call us to love one another. Let that be what everybody sees. Cause us to love those with whom we disagree. It's easy to love those that say all the things we like. Cause us to love those who say the things that we like the least. Let us look like you, Jesus. Ultimately, that's what our faith is about. It's in your name we pray.